Hello, my name is Dr. Satoshi Tateshima, Interventional Neuroradiology uh, Professor. I've been uh, practicing uh, Interventional Neuroradiology since 2005 when I joined UCLA. And uh, what we do is two things. One is, of course, we do research to uh, learn etiology and also the disease process of brain aneurysms. And also we are inventing and also treating the way how we treat uh, brain aneurysms. And let me uh, introduce one uh, piece of history. Uh, 30 years ago, UCLA uh, faculties invented a way to treat brain aneurysms very low invasively. This coil is called uh, gabapentin detachable coils. And using this coil, very first brain aneurysm was treated. And here is the experimental result published in neurosurgery in 1992. 30 years later, now this is a standard of care. Now, not just the UCLA, everybody on the planet doing the same procedure. Uh, now, uh, less uh, aneurysms are treated open surgically, and the vast majority of aneurysms are treated using this very technique invented by uh, my seniors at UCLA Interventional Neuroradiology. So, uh, first, what's a brain aneurysm or intracranial aneurysm? Uh, it starts from a tiny injury uh, to the uh, brain arteries, or we call intracranial arteries. It could be age-related, or it could be something like uh, cigarette smoking or recreational drug abuse. Anything that promotes aging can induce a brain aneurysm or some genetic condition. The important thing is that once it bursts or ruptures, then that can cause a highly fatal uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, one of the most severe form of uh, stroke. Approximately 2% of the uh, US population harbors a brain aneurysm, actually a 20% chance that they have multiple aneurysms. The good thing is it does not burst that often. In fact, only one out of uh, roughly 10,000 uh, population uh, per year, uh, that's the subarachnoid hemorrhage rate. So, not all aneurysms uh, rupture. So we have to find out which one's uh, more dangerous and which one can be just uh, observed. That's actually our first step when we see a patient with a brain aneurysm. So we compare the risk of having that aneurysm untreated, and also we have to compare the risk of the treatment. If the risk uh, is smaller, by just treating it, we offer treatment. And if the risk is uh, smaller, by just watching it, we just keep watching. So having an aneurysm doesn't mean that uh, you have to have a treatment. And there are many ways to predict aneurysm rupture risk or you know, having an aneurysm, the risk of having an aneurysm. Uh, but essentially, larger aneurysms, the larger the aneurysm, the higher the chance of bleeding. So higher chance that we offer a treatment. And also depending on the aneurysm location, uh, certain location carries much higher risk than the other part of the uh, brain arteries. And also age affects, not just the age affects uh, the rupture risk, bleeding risk. Let's say small bleeding risk aneurysm found in a small pediatric population, lifelong rupture risk might, must be very high. So very likely that we have to offer treatment. So, Considering all these factors, we could estimate the lifelong risk of brain aneurysm uh, related to stroke. We also use our own research. Let's say we just keep watching certain small aneurysms, but we found that uh, certain aneurysms, they grow. The chance is roughly 20%. So once those aneurysms, they grow or show some unstable features, then the risk of bleeding becomes 12 times higher. So considering all these factors, uh, we offer the best management to the patient. And here's one example. Uh, this uh, aneurysm is so-called vertebral artery aneurysm. Remains very small throughout the follow-up uh, 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 durations. Compared to that, this anterior communicating artery aneurysm shows stability up to the six months, but 1.5 year later, it's obvious that the aneurysm is growing. So this patient unfortunately had to have a treatment. And 
again, we are treatment uh, division and also we are imaging division. So we are uh, best uh, and really good at uh, developing a program to follow these uh, aneurysms using a serious uh, serial imaging uh, such as this. And let's say we have to offer treatment to our patients. Uh, most likely we offer simple coiling because the simpler the better. Uh, usually that carries much smaller risk. And coiling uh, carries uh, three different phases. One is framing, one is fitting, and the last finishing. It's like uh, the golf, playing a golf. The driving and the iron uh, approaching and the putting. The first framing we use a bigger coil and uh, match the size of the coil to the diameter of the aneurysm and uh, fill the aneurysm uh, with a, a very strong robust coil uh, by manipulating microcatheters. And then we fill that the uh, 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 inside of the frame gradually with softer coils. And the toward, towards the finishing, we focus on uh, packing right around the entry of the aneurysm we call aneurysm neck using very soft coils and a packet. And once the volume uh, of the coil mass reaches or exceeds the 25% volume of the aneurysm, that coil mass tends to be very stable and we see aneurysm cure oftentimes. So here is the actual uh, example of aneurysm patient. You see that the big aneurysm here, although it's a tall aneurysm, it's not necessarily that big. And we put one coil here. This is a successful framing. And pay attention that no coil loops coming out of this parent artery, uh, into the parent artery. And now after finishing and feeding, you no longer see uh, the blood flow going to this aneurysm. And it's been more than actually 10 years since this treatment and this particular patient is doing great. So this is simple coiling, but it doesn't go this way all the time. Sometimes uh, brain aneurysm, they give rise to a, a very important branch uh, from the dome or from the aneurysm itself. And this is internal carotid artery, anterior choroidal artery, a branching side aneurysm. And you can see that the tiny branch coming off from the base of this aneurysm. This tiny branch, although it's very small, feeds very important uh, uh, structure in the brain called posterior limb of internal capsule. That structure is a bunch of fibers connecting the motor strip here to the uh, uh, leg and arm. So by blocking this with aneurysm and shut down the flow, we shut down the, uh, the blood flow to that structure and the patient may have hemi body weakness. So we have to do two counteracting missions. Shut down the flow into this aneurysm, but we have to maintain the flow this, uh, into this small branch. So here's the actual working angle. And uh, that's, that's the shadow of this aneurysm. And here's the branch that we have to preserve. Otherwise, we would give a, a hemi body weakness to this patient. And we have to intentionally leave a space, triangle space here. And using modern coiling and uh, the techniques, we can achieve this mission. The way how we do it is we have to tailor, we have to give a specific shape to this microcatheter, uh, matching the shape of this, this particular patient anatomy. Then the park right, that microcatheter right next to the structure that we would like to pre, uh, uh, preserve that uh, enables uh, coils to be pushed out, pushed away from that structure. And then little by little, we uh, create the frame and uh, fill that uh, frame with subsequent coils. And uh, we repeat this process until we feel all the way up towards the neck. And you see that the little uh, uh, intentionally left space uh, uh, here, uh, preserving a blood flow into this tiny branch. And here is the final outcome. You see that the branch is completely preserved. This is another angle. Aneurysm is completely blocked and the branch is preserved. So compared to open surgery, the uh, learning curve of uh, aneurysm coiling is steep, yet uh, it is highly skill dependent. So it's very important to be seen by aneurysm professional. And coiling is great, but uh, it does not work for certain cases. This is an example. Uh, this is a giant aneurysm from internal carotid artery. 
uh, and in this patient, you can see that unfortunately sh she lost the uh, ability to move her right eye because of this big aneurysm impinging onto one of the nerves controlling her right eye. And we don't want to pack this aneurysm with coils because that could worsen uh, the, uh, the pressure onto the already uh, injured nerve. In a case like this, we use a stent called flow divergence stent. We have to do radical reconstruction. It sounds radical, but uh, it can be done relatively easily. And here is uh, the reconstruction of internal carotid artery. And this uh, stent induces clotting in this gigantic aneurysm. And one year later, uh, aneurysm is completely healed up, and she regained her uh, right eye motion back again. So using the right device for the right uh, uh, situation is a part of a skill set. There are numerous endovascular devices available. So it's not just the hand motion. The judgment uh, makes the uh, big difference in terms of the outcome. Sometimes we have to use both stent and coil. This is one of the examples. Uh, this patient uh, has an extensive injury to the uh, uh, right and left, particularly left side, anterior cerebral artery, and a very unstable growing aneurysm was found here. Again, the issue is there is a very important branch coming off from the aneurysm. So we have to achieve three missions. One is to give reinforcement to extensively injured artery and also pack this unstable aneurysm while preserving this very important eloquent branch. We don't want to block this branch. So what we did was reconstructing this weakened artery with the flow divergence stent and this unstable growing portion of the aneurysm was coiled uh, and the branches preserved and six months follow-up angiogram showing very stable patent parent arteries, aneurysm is completely coiled up, gone, and all branches preserved. So by just combining them, uh, we could achieve a good result like this. Certain cases, we use, instead of coils, a mesh ball device, we call mesh uh, web device. This patient had a, a ugly looking anterior communicating artery aneurysm, and also the issue was this patient doesn't have a left side carotid artery. So her right carotid artery is feeding right side and left side of the brain. And we didn't want to put any metal hardware around here. So we wanted to treat this aneurysm by just staying within the aneurysm without adding any metals in the arteries. And by just looking at the uh, axis of the parent artery here, it just takes us directly into the aneurysm which means that the microcatheter access is not that difficult. In this type of anatomy, we can use this mesh ball device. The benefit is we don't have to put multiple coils. It's just one undone. And here's the picture of a mesh ball device being deployed. Once it opens up, we manipulate the positioning in the aneurysm, and we make sure that the, the device is not blocking the flow in the parent artery and just blocking the flow going into the aneurysm. And once we are happy, we detach the device, and you see that the aneurysm is gone. This is before, this is after. So we cannot really cover the entire uh, uh, options uh, to treat aneurysms, but the point that I would like to make is we have many different devices available, and also we are working on uh, inventing new devices and I can guarantee that uh, our program can offer best treatment options available in this country. So as an academic center, we are not just doing our new some treatment, but also we are tre uh, inventing uh, something new and studying a lot of uh, new materials and doing extensive research. This is one of the examples. We like to shorten the recovery time for our patients and for that, uh, we invented the technology to make the uh, metal surface super hydrophilic. By doing so, you can see that the tissue grows uh, much faster over super hydrophilic uh, uh, coating surface compared to regular metals. This is one of the examples uh, of our surface modification research. 
hopefully in the future uh, we can apply this technology uh, to achieve better outcome for our patients. Another pioneer, uh, pioneering effort uh, from us is robotics. We are applying robotics in interventional neural radiology. And you can see that uh, this catheter uh, is manipulated, controlled by this robotic system. I'm staying outside of the uh, procedure room. It is really actually good for us because in the procedure room, we have to wear lead. Uh, that may be uh, tiring for us and less fatigue means we can focus on the procedure. And also, potentially, by using this robotic system, we can enhance the safety and accuracy of our catheter manipulation. And we are publishing our techniques uh, in uh, Journal of Interventional uh, Radiology, or Journal of Neurointerventional uh, Surgery. And you can see that the catheter is going up to the neck, and this machine is capable uh, of uh, manipulating even microcatheter going into the brain. And in this pandemic, it's very important that uh, uh, we offer treatment regardless of the patient infectious condition. Although this is not an aneurysm patient, but uh, this machine is capable of delivering the coils. This is a nosebleed patient in a COVID-19 pneumonia, and you can see that the coils being placed using this joystick, this uh, robotic system can be used for the future aneurysm treatment as well. And the techniques are also published in Journal of Neurointerventional Surgery. So if you have any questions related this, to this presentation, our research or our procedural uh, uh, technique, anything, just uh, feel free to email me. And also, if you have uh, any question about aneurysm or you are interested in consultation, please give us a call. We have uh, excellent uh, six faculties uh, uh, offering very same procedures and the research. Thank you for listening.